about 1974, we had a clinic and a, and a store, like a trading post inside of Shui. And uh, the Indian, Indians would come and buy things from us. And uh, when they would buy things from us, they would have money, money that the bills were all wet and they stank and they were torn. And they were kind of the kind of bills that, that in the downtown, the storekeepers wouldn't take them. And, uh, but we would take them and we'd end up with a stack of these real grungy, smelly, wet uh, peso bills. And then when I would go to Barranquilla, I would go to the Banco de la República, that's the national bank, and uh, exchange them, peso for peso. And uh, I'd come back with brand spanking new ones, crisp and new. And uh, that became pretty well known in the mountains, that if you went to Sarachui, you could come away with brand new bills. And that was a phenomenon. Because in Guatapuri, Chamescamina, even at Tanques, such a thing didn't even exist, these brand new bills. And uh, of course, I went to Barranquilla maybe every three months or something, and, and then I'd bring a new batch back. And uh, I would fix things for the Indians, their shotguns and, and traps, and uh, their uh, shellers for the coffee. And uh, I had a mechanic shop there. And uh, about that time, the, the uh, I don't know if it was just the United States, but the Geodetic Society, I guess that's what it's called, uh, was surveying the Sierra Nevada, surveying the, the world, I guess. And I think they were probably setting up for, uh, you know, aerial photographs of everything, sort of like what we have now if you go to on the computer and look at world. But anyway, in the course of that, a helicopter landed in front of our house. And the helicopters would come up the valley, past Atanques over the ridge, and past Guatapuri, and follow the valley, and go up the valley towards the, the lakes up there. And uh, this one occasion, they landed at our place. Other times they would go over uh, towards Avingui and other places. And uh, the people in Guatapuri, that's a little village down there in the valley, had no idea where these helicopters were going. They'd see them going up the valley, they'd be up there for a while, or it, and then come back. And so uh, rumors began to uh, come out that uh, uh, there was drugs now, some people were producing drugs and uh, growing marijuana and putting it in bales and uh, with hydraulic presses, they make these little bricks of marijuana. And hippies were coming up through the valleys and, and uh, so marijuana was going out. And we had some enemies because of healing the Indians and trying to help the Indians get a square deal. They would be cheated by by some of the, the people that would come up in the mountains. And uh, we would say, how much did you pay for that radio? The radio was only worth maybe $30 and they gave a, a whole oxen for it and that type of thing. And it didn't work, now it didn't work. And so uh, we'd tell them, you know, you can take that back to the guy and it doesn't work. You pay way too much for it. Well, I guess doing that, we would get ourselves in trouble. And uh, even though we would pull teeth for everybody, even the guys who traded with the Indians and uh, sell them medicines, treat their, their sick and everything, they began to hate us and saw us as competition. And uh, they weren't interested, of course, in the gospel at all. And uh, the gospel was a challenge to them because we would teach fairness and justice and doing things right, love your enemies as yourself and your neighbors yourself, etc. Well, there were a couple.
couple of men that uh, were involved in really big coffee business and also moving the drugs around. And one of them, uh, I'm not going to use his name, had a real big farm and I went across his farm uh, when I would go over to uh, where the Ottawa Indians were and it was quite a hike up to his farm. And uh, anyway, uh, he killed a couple of Indians. And he, one of them he left hanging in the barbed wire fence because he didn't want any Indians coming across his property. And, uh, and so, you know, that was an injustice and, and we would comment on that type of thing. Well, he uh, was really, had, was becoming an enemy of ours. But to my face, he was a real hypocrite. And uh, one day... We were having uh, some construction done, and one of the men that was there working for us was a an outlaw. He had killed some policemen and two policemen in Venezuela, and he was wanted by the law. And he, so he escaped uh, the authorities to a tankish, and uh, I didn't know it, this about him, but he was a good uh, avanil. Um, stonemason and uh, we needed some construction work done putting in a foundation and everything so we asked uh, hired him to come up there and he was working up at our place with another man and then uh, also Saul was there and we were there when we saw coming over the rise uh, that come up from from San Jose three men and uh, as they got closer, you could see that one was dressed neatly in a khaki uniform, and uh, one had a, a camouflage on, and uh, the other one had plain clothes. And uh, these guys came walking right up to the house, and I was outside to meet them. And uh, they told me right off that uh, the one was National Police Secret Service, one was Interpol from Venezuela, and the other was the, uh, the military. And these three men came up to investigate what we were doing up there and who we were. And uh, they would like to, me to answer some questions and search our property. So I said, nothing to hide, no problem. And uh, they were... They were polite at this point. And uh, so I was down at the light plant house, and uh, we had guns. I had guns there that were not registered. And Mama was afraid that uh, these guys would find the guns and then we'd really be in trouble. So uh, she hid the guns under the mattress in the bedroom. And, uh, but then she saw that I was showing these guys everything. We went to the bunkhouse, and then next to the bunkhouse, we went to the tack room and the feed room where I had barrels of feed and the pack saddles and the saddles. I was showing them everything. And uh, they said to the man that was working there, uh, you guys keep, your, keep working, but don't leave. Just stay right here. And uh, so uh, I th they were probably keeping an eye on them, but all three were interested in asking me questions. And, uh, and so just out of nowhere, they said, we went over to where the little dollhouse was and uh, sat down over there. And, and they said, okay, now we have some questions for you. We want to know where your printing press is, where this new money's coming from. And we want to know where your garden, where your fields are of marijuana, and we want to see your press that you're making, you're pressing the marijuana. We want to know where the helicopter lands, how often he's here, and actually it only ever came come one time. And uh, uh, what else? Oh, where where's your training camp? We understand that you have a, a group of Cubans here. And uh, they're 
mercenaries and you're training them. Uh, and so we want to know where that's at. And by this time, they one's standing here, one's standing here, and one's standing here. And I'm sitting there. And uh, they were like right over me. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know anything about what you're talking about. And then the guy with the, uh, the khaki suit from the Interpol, he got real stern. And he says, look, we have a list of, against you that long. And I'm going to answer, get the answers to every one of those questions before you get up and before we get out of here. And uh, so then I got real serious and I said, gentlemen, honestly, you may search the property anywhere around here. Uh, you're not going to find any answers to those kind of questions. I am not training Cuban guerrillas. I am not uh, producing marijuana and, and packing it and packing it. Uh, the helicopter was here one time. It was the Geo National Geodetic Society and it landed right out front there. And I wasn't even here when that came that day. Uh, inside the house, of course, Mama doesn't know what's going on and she's real concerned. And then, uh, so they, they asked me questions trying to get me to get confused, I guess, or whatever like that, uh, for a couple of hours, like in the afternoon. And uh, Mama asked if they were going to eat something, and uh, she was making food, and uh, we were trying to be hospitable. And uh, they were confused because they were finding that all these accusations that they had were ungrounded. And uh, so finally they said, okay, well look, consider yourself and your, your workers here under house arrest. We're going to spend the night and uh, you're not to leave the house. And uh, your men will be down in the bunk, bunk house and uh, they will not come out until morning. No one will leave the house until morning. And uh, I think they were thinking that someone would show up at night or something was going to happen at night uh, under cover of darkness or something and uh, all night long they were patrolling around the house walking around and uh, I, I forgot to say that in the afternoon when it was getting evening uh, one of them walked up to this water supply the water system checked that out and uh, they, they just went over the whole property, and then in the morning, uh, they had some breakfast, Mama made breakfast, and then they said, uh, okay, we're going to take you with us to buy your car, just like that. And uh, they wanted my passports, uh, and I said the passports were in a Tonkis, and, uh, and they said, okay, we'll, we'll go down and we'll get them in a Tonkis. We want to see your coming and going in the country. So, Mama didn't know if she'd ever see me again. These three guys, armed. They did find the guns. Mama took them back and put them back in where I had had them placed. And uh, they were going to confiscate them. But the Interpol guy uh, really argued with the uh, policeman. The policeman wanted our guns because they were sporting guns, and I had a, a cowboy-type gun and stuff like that. Anyway, he wanted them. But the Interpol guy would not let him take them. And uh, so they stayed in the house. But then down the trail we went. We got to a Tonkis, and uh, I looked in our dresser. I looked where I thought the, com the passports were. They were not there. And they said, well, we got to... We have a car here, and uh, we're going to take you to Bayou du Par. So we went on to Bayou du Par, went to the DOS, and, uh, and then one of them s stayed there, and two of them went with me to the governor of uh, Cesar, and uh, 
they talked with him about who made the denuncia, who made the accusations, and uh, they got the name of the guy, the big rancher up there, and uh, they said, you know, he's he's a scoundrel and everything else like that. And, and after a while, they just said, well, you're free to go. So <laughs> I went back home that same afternoon, and I think. I don't know if Mama was glad to see me or not. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't. You didn't come home that night. It was the next day. Did I stay down here Probably overnight yeah. one time? Yeah. Okay. Some of those things, uh, some of the details of some of that sort of thing, is a little, a little fuzzy. But uh, I praise God that you know we we always had a good name with. Everybody except the guys who were raising, raising drugs and cheating the Indians and that sort of thing. So.